I, I'm going to be uh, covering three main areas that really jumped out at me from both the Torah reading and the Acts reading. Uh, I want to talk about some of the practical applications that we can glean from the Deuteronomy reading. Uh, obviously, some of them aren't things that you can literally do. And uh, so, you know, the of course, the Hebrew term for those commandments that we can actually apply to our lives is mitzvot, right? So I'm going to be talking some of the mitzvot from Deuteronomy. And I'm also going to be talking about a non, non-mitzvah that keeps popping up. It's a non-commandment that keeps popping up. So watch for that. Um, I want to look at the vision that we get of Messiah from the Deuteronomy reading. Wow, this part is so rich with just such a broad a broad uh, job description of who Yeshua is and what he came to do and uh, what what he's going to be doing in the future when he returns also. And uh, then I want to I want to give you a couple of Hebrew highlights from Acts cuz uh y- you can just sense like this Hebrew thought pattern and Hebraic ways of speech speaking in the Acts passage and I think it'll really help make it come alive for you. And uh we're also going to do a little Bible quizzing. Yeah. I uh, I just some of this I'm just going to be doing on the fly. It came to me um, just as we were driving down here and uh, as we were sitting there reading. So I, I think it's going to be fun. So uh, to begin with, I uh, want to tell you about my parents. Um, their names are Chris and Judy. Chris is my dad and Judy is my mom. No, these aren't my, my real parents, just so you know. This is a, this is a parable, okay? And uh, Chris, my dad... I've learned some very, very, uh, very uh, valuable uh, lessons of faith from him. Um, he, he's a Christian. He believes in, in Jesus as the Messiah, and uh, he loves the Bible. And uh, and uh, and I'm I'm proud to call him the father in the faith. And uh, and Judy, my mom, well, she's Jewish, and uh, she practices Judaism. And at this point, most of Judy doesn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah because Judies don't do that, generally speaking. Hey, you know where I'm going with this? It's a parable, right? Um, you know, as, as, a, as a roots group, as a Messianic Jewish congregation, however you view us, um, this is essentially what we are. Um, we, we, we are the child of God, right? Um, most of us come from a Christian background, and uh, we, 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 um, we have a very deep love for the scriptures. We read them literally. Uh, we have high, high Christology. Um, and... Uh, Quite a few things like this. we believe in Yeshua, we believe in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Um, you know, I, I, in, in, in many regards, we're also a daughter or, or a son, a child of Judaism. In that, our Savior was Jewish. Uh, the authors of the New Testament were Jewish. It's actually a very thoroughly Jewish document. Um, you know, there's that element in the early church and how they expressed their faith that definitely had those that Jewish uh, that Jewish look. And uh, not only that, but in the 1960s, as significant numbers of Jewish people began coming to faith in Yeshua, um, that, that began a movement in the of, of us returning to the roots of our faith. A lot of Christians in different churches saw these Messianic Jews, Jews that believe in Jesus, and they said, wow, they, they look a lot like those, those first Jewish disciples. You know, they, they, it was just this feel like, this looks like the early church, in a, in a way that we have not seen as the body of Christ in hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and so, you know, starting especially in the 60s, uh, a lot of Christians began coming to Messianic Jewish congregations and just feeling that draw. They felt like they were coming home, like they were returning to their roots. And uh, really, uh, we as a congregation are a direct, we're the direct progeny of the early Messianic Jewish movement. Uh, it started, like, really with some Jewish believers in the 1800s, and, but it really broke out in the 1960s. And here we are. So that, that's how I can say that that I'm a, I'm a son of Chris and Judy. They're my mom and dad. And you know, I, I really appreciate Chris and Judy, my parents. I, I, I honor them. I have, I've learned everything from them really about my faith. Uh, but you know, uh, having said that, in some regards, I look at Chris and Judy, my parents, and I say, you know, I, well, my dad Chris, he says this, but when I, when I read the Bible, I'm not sure if I see it that way. You know, my mom Judy, she, she says this, but, uh, maybe she does it this way, but you know, when I, when I read the scriptures, I'm not sure if it lines up. So, you know, in this, in this family of faith, I, I think there's room to honor our parents and yet at the same time to compare things to the Word, compare things to our, our Messiah and His example, and uh, in some areas maybe even respectfully dissent. I, I think uh, 
you know, if, if we come from a Protestant background, we have a very long tradition of dissent, don't we? We are protesters. We protest stuff. It's in our blood. You know, if you come from a Mennonite background, then um, that's very strong in your heritage also. Maybe not in the last couple centuries, but I, I remember when... Can I tell that story from Hope Fellowship? Okay, well, we, we had a meeting where we were just getting acquainted with the elders of Hope Fellowship Church. They're Mennonite Brethren Church here in Saskatoon, but they have a love for Israel, and they try and do the feasts and stuff like this. And uh, one of their elders there, he, he, we, we kind of explained to him what we're about as a congregation, what our heartbeat is, and he said, you know, it's good what you're doing. That's what we did as Mennonites 400 years ago. You know, and so he had a lot of room for us, you know. In, 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 the, in the Mennonite approach, there's room to, to examine the scriptures and to say, you know, I, I, I want to do this thing by the book. And maybe they look a little different. And uh, for those of us who maybe come from Dukobor background, we have a very radical history of that. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> so anyway, um, these, these are, these are, this is like kind of, I just want set to the, set the tone with that. In uh, the, very, the very opening um, verses of this Parsha um, in Deuteronomy 16, he uh, repeats himself. He says that we're supposed to persecute something. We're supposed to persecute righteousness. No, uh, in, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, you could read it like that. The Hebrew word for persecuting means to violently pursue or to aggressively go after something. So, what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20, actually, is uh, justice Justice you shall pursue. And the, the, the Hebrew word there is redah. Okay? That's what, like, Paul was doing when he, like, you know, as, as, a, when he was before a believer in Yeshua. He was persecuting. He was pursuing the believers. And that's the word here. And so you, you just get this call, hey? Like, when it comes to justice, it's something to aggressively pursue. It's something to, to really go after. And, uh, he even repeats it twice. The, the Hebrew word there is tzedek. Can we all say tzedek? tzedek. Yeah, okay. So like the, the root tzedek means like to, to be right, to be correct. It's, it's actually like a legal term, right? It means correctness, um, etc. And uh, the, 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 the usual expression for righteousness is tzedaka. Can you say tzedaka? And then tzedek here is kind of like a shorter form. It's a beautiful word. Genevieve made this really beautiful piece of art. It's a tzedek in Hebrew in the middle. I was going to bring it to show it to you, and I forgot. I'm sorry. But uh, anyway, so like we hear this call in the Torah to really go after righteousness. And I, I think we could take this on at least one of two levels. Um, like, okay, contextually it's talking about the court system. It's talking about how, you, how you're in a, a judge in a court. And uh, I don't know if any of us have that profession, so we could say, well, this doesn't apply to us. But maybe it does apply to us on a broader level, eh? I mean, uh, um, you, you could see this in one of two ways. There's like... There's, there's tzedek with the Almighty. Like, there's being right with God. And uh, that is something that we've experienced through faith in Messiah. Right? Uh, we have a deep righteousness. It's, a, it's, a, it's an inner righteousness. Um, and it's not based on our, our works or our behavior or performance or whatever. It's based on what Messiah did for us. Right? And uh, Paul was really big on that. And I'm really big on that too. So that's a righteousness that we have and that we cherish. The question is, what do we do after he makes us right? What do we do after we become righteous through faith? You know, we don't really, we don't just like go off and do it and, and like live like the devil or whatever. Right? I mean, uh, if, if, if we're, we're truly righteous in terms of our identity and uh, who we've been regenerated as, then that of course is going to be expressed in how we, how we live our lives, how we treat our families and the people around us, how we conduct business, etc. Right? And so, what I see in this verse as it applies to us is we can let the Messiah kindle a passion in our hearts for His righteousness. Not only being right with God, which we are through faith, but expressing that in, in these practical areas I just mentioned. Expressing it in how we, how we express our faith in Messiah. Uh, religious practice. Uh, all kinds of things like that. So, uh, I, I wanted to have a little, a, little, a little fun with that this week. There, there's an interesting series of commandments in Deuteronomy. And... Uh, I want to talk a little about Chris and Judy, our parents. Okay? Um, okay, like, in our congregation, we very much view ourselves as part of the body of Christ. Right? We're part of the body of Christ. Uh, we love the greater body of Messiah. And uh, 
that's that's what we are. Like, you know, this whole concept of church bashing, like speaking badly about the church, like we have zero tolerance for that here, right? That doesn't matter. However, it's also true that as part of the body of Christ, there's always been room for protesting if we're Protestant. And there's been room for dissenting. There's been room for, 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 for studying the Bible and say we want to return to the most biblical church. We want to in our traditions and our theology in light of what the Word has to say and the, the example that Messiah left for us, right? And, uh, I don't know, because we come from a Christian background, most of us, I think, we, we more often will, will do that with our Christian background, right? Often, um, though, like, we don't talk as much about the Jewish side of things. And what, what about traditional Judaism? What, are there things in traditional Judaism that don't square with the written Torah? Just for fun, I would I would share with you a couple areas where I think Judy may be doing a little off based on based on the Torah itself. So what do you think? Could we could we look at a couple of examples? And uh, I thought that would I thought that would be fun. Um, here here's a little example, and this is some of this is going to just be my personal thoughts where I'm at. In uh, Deuteronomy 17:3, it talks about worshipping like the sun and the moon and stars and stuff. I, I don't think any of us do that. I pray none of us do that secretly. You know, that's kind of being eradicated from our culture. It's not a big problem. But it is weird how threads and elements that sometimes trace down. I'm going to give you an example. Like, um, you know, often in Judaism, if you want to congratulate someone and wish them the best, you say what? Well, mazel Tov. That's right. Does, does any of us actually know what Mazel Tov means? Well, you know that what it means to people is just congratulations. But, but it literally means like good constellation. Yeah, and, and it's from the idea that the constellations and the positions um, affect your life. That you want to you want certain events or you want certain birth birth things to be to happen under auspicious signs in the heavens. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm just a little uncomfortable with that idea. Okay, now you know what like. Most people don't think that when they say it, right? So when someone wishes me Mazal Tov, when tears is born or whatever, I can take their good wishes to heart and I can appreciate it. But inside I think, but I don't take that literally, right? So I, 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 what I would suggest, and even in the Messianic Jewish community, is maybe we want to steer clear of terms like Mazal Tov. And just because it's Jewish doesn't mean it's biblical. And just because it's, just because Judy doesn't, doesn't even mean it's right. Yeah. So you know, maybe you can, maybe we can think of some some other terms, some more meaningful terms, some better ones. So I don't even know if we say Mazel Tov in our congregation. You know, and some people they do, and I just think, man, I read an interesting article on Chab on a Chabad website. Actually, I don't usually read Chabad websites, but I was looking up this Mazel Tov thing, right? And this author like bent over backwards to try and get around the fact that this means like, uh, you know, I, I want you to have success because of the configuration of the constellations and heavenly bodies. You know, and they were saying, well, you know, another meaning of Mazal is to flow. So it's saying that you'll have a good flow, that you'll have a flow of inspiration and heavenly wisdom. And I was like, that sounds really good, but that's not where it came from. But anyway, so if we want to say, well, that's what we can think to ourselves. Like, yes, it's talking about the divine flow of wisdom or whatever, I don't know. So anyway, that's a, that's an interesting one that we, that we see in this passage. Um, here's another example. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verses 9 to 14. Now this again is talking about the court system in Israel. It's, uh, it's talking about civil law. And it says, uh, let's say you're having like an argument or a lawsuit, uh, homicide, assault, any type of like uh, civil dispute. It says you get up and you go to the place which Yahweh your God chooses you. So you, you go to the Levitical priest or the judge in those days and you inquire of them and they'll declare to you the verdict in the case. And uh, do according to the terms of the verdict which they declare to you from the place which Yahweh chooses. And uh, be careful to observe according to all that they teach you. So anyway, this is essentially what the passage says. And uh, this is actually the passage in the in the Torah that um, for the last 18, 1900 years, uh, the like rabbinic leadership of Judaism has has based their authority on. They say we are that authority. Um, we are the judge. And you are required, according to the Torah, to submit to all of our teachings, all of our legal decisions, all the halakha that we set. And uh, I, I, I have some discomfort with that. Um, number one, there were some things that were taught in traditional Judaism in Yeshua's time that he took issue with. Um, he had a problem with some areas where Judy would add to the Torah. Uh, she would 
maybe add things like, God commanded us to wash our hands before we eat, and we bless the God who's washed our hands before we eat, even though that's not written in the Word. And of course, you know, like, that's the concept of the oral law, right? God gave two Torahs to Moses on Mount Sinai, the written Torah and the oral Torah. And the written one is the one we have here, and then the oral one is the one that has been passed down orally through the rabbis, and that's where we have extra stuff. You know, so I, I have some, I have some hesitations with, with some of that as I think we all do. But it's just, I just, I thought historically it's, it's interesting that this is the passage that that is based on. That supposedly gives the oral law and uh, rabbinical leadership absolute authority. And you know me, I appreciate traditional Judaism. I, I, I think it's a great place to start when we want to understand certain passages, when we want to see how uh, commandments have been interpreted, but we don't view it as auth- like 100% authoritative, right? So that's an interesting historical point there. Uh, I, I see three problems also. If you want to look at this passage, let's like flick on our critical apparatus for a second. Um, I see three problems also with this um, that doesn't line up, which makes me think that this passage is being misappropriated in traditional Judaism as as applying to uh, rabbinic leadership. Number one, it says, go to the place which Yahweh chooses. That's Jerusalem. So I'm, I'm sorry, but Brooklyn never has been and never will be the place that he chooses. It doesn't matter how many sects of Judaism are based in Brooklyn. Um, that place has been and always will be Jerusalem. Uh, number two, it says, it, it, it includes the Levitical priest. And, uh, you know, the Pharisaic movement in the Second Temple era, it was a good movement. Yeshua was very close to that. However, to the degree that they eclipsed Levitical authority, they made a mistake. So that's that's the second problem there. Um, Problem number three is it says, um, oh yeah, the context of this isn't like interpreting the Torah and applying it to your life. The context is just, it's a civil context. It's talking about civil disputes in the land of Israel, right? So anyway, maybe that doesn't apply to us in the next week in terms of how we do life, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's good to know because we are walking between two faith movements, and we're taking what we see as biblical truth from both of them. And we, in many ways, re- identify ourselves with both of them, right? So I, I think it's, it's, it's good to be fluent in some of these things. Here's another example. This is one of my favorite commandments in the whole Torah. Like, I actually built myself this cool little set of tefillin, like phylacteries. I made them out of leather, and I, I wrote out, like, the scripture passages that are usually put in them. And then, you know, I'd like put one on my head and put one on my arm. And it was about like radical devotion to Messiah, right? Just a way of saying, like, I am so passionate about your word. I want to literally do some of this stuff. Tie it on my body, you know? And uh, so anyway, I made my own. It was a really meaningful experience. And I didn't only put in the uh, passages that are usually put in, but I put in one more because it was so special to me. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, um, and on, going more towards like 15, it talks about how Yahweh, our God, is going to raise up a prophet. And the prophet's going to be like Moses. And uh, there's this, this call to, to listen to him, to shema to him, right? So one of, the, one of the commandments in the Torah is to shema to the prophet that Yahweh's going to raise up, the prophet like Moses. Who was that? It was Yeshua, that's right, it was our Savior. Uh, in Acts, they, they actually quote this passage, the apostles in Acts 3, and they say, and this is Yeshua. And uh, so anyway, I just think, wow, it's so cool that it's actually like one of the commandments in the foundational books of the Bible to listen to the prophet Yeshua, to like to take him seriously in everything he has to say, to, to structure our lives according to his teachings. This is a Torah commandment here. And uh, unfortunately, this is one that... that uh, that our, our Judy hasn't done so well with for the last 1900 years or so. You know, like, um, there have always been Jewish believers in Jesus, right? And, uh, and they have listened to, to Jesus the prophet. However, having said that, most of Judaism hasn't taken Yeshua very seriously. They, they haven't listened to his teachings. M- many Jewish people have never even read the New Testament. They just go by hearsay, which is unfortunate because then they go by all the crazy misrepresentations of our Savior that are out there in the world. So anyway, um, isn't, it, isn't it cool though? Like this is a commandment that the Father is going to restore his Jewish people to, to listening to Yeshua, to shamaing to his voice. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, and uh, I'll talk about Chris for just a moment here too. <laughs> um, okay, like, you know, in, in 16, 
it talks about some things that you want to avoid, it's like th like stuff from the Baal cult and the Asherah cult. One of them is like sacred trees and planting them next to altars, and we think, ha, yeah, like that that's ancient, that's four thousand years. We never do stuff like that now, right? Actually, we kind of do. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. Like in church, you know, you have the altar at the front. That's called the altar, right? What do we do every winter solstice? We bring in an asher tree and we put it next to the altar. And I'm not saying that to be judgmental, right? But I mean, we do it. And and if you look at the origins of the Christmas tree, they come straight out of that cult. That doesn't nowhere in the Bible does it talk about that, except for once in Jeremiah. <laughs> but um, anyway, so you know, I'm, I, but I'm going to give you an example of this because I want to counterbalance this. And I don't know how you guys are going to think of me, but like in, in Prince Albert at Crown of Messiah, we meet in a Baptist church. We meet in the gym, and we're developing a good friendship with them. We love them there, and they love us. Uh, some of them joined us for our Passover seder. But like around Christmas time, they like they were gonna like uh, bring a Christmas tree into the sanctuary, right? And that's just when we started meeting there. And so anyway, we like did our service in the morning, and we were having lunch, our own egg time, right? And uh, then uh, Kate, the office manager, comes in, and she's like, "Could we, uh, could we get like get your help for something? Uh, we need to set up a platform in the front so we and and put the put up the Christmas tree." And I was like, "Oh, I don't really believe in Christmas trees, you know. Like I." I don't see it in the scriptures, and I don't see it in Yeshua's example and stuff. And I was thinking this, but I was thinking like, okay, you know what? Most of the body of Christ has been doing this for a really long time, and it's not my place to judge, right? This is a personal conviction of mine, and we're developing a relationship with this church. And I know that peace is really important in the body of Messiah. So you know what? I, I don't know. I don't even know if this was right or wrong, okay? But I went and I helped them. I went, we went and we helped put up the little stage thing. I don't think I put the tree up, but I helped set up the stage for them to put the tree on, right? So I just want to say that I'm coming at this from a vantage point of like, I love the body and I, I believe in working to see the body restored. But you know what? It is a process. May I, may I, a little by, a little at a time, you know? So anyway, uh, just having said that though, I think, you know, Paul said in Romans that like, the most important things in the faith are like that peace with each other's brothers, that joy that we have in our salvation, you know, loving each other. And uh, and so I, I really want to key in on that. But it is kind of frightening, um, that one. Another one would be like, you know, 1622, don't put up pillars or steeples or spires or whatever. I mean, that's another thing from this, like some really ancient cults, right? And they did that a lot in Egypt. Well, you know, the 300s, if you read your church history, Constantine develops the new Roman Catholic Church. And what does he do with these new churches that he's building? He, he goes to Egypt and he, he imports some of the original obelisks from these ancient pagan religions. And he brings them to Rome. He brings them to Constantinople. And he erects them in his new churches. Or in his new churches. And I, I, I just think, wow. Like, Maybe that's what happens when we cut the Old Testament out of our Bibles. We just we lose touch with some of this, you know? And so, I mean, hey, I don't know. Like, the Baptist Church in Prince Albert, where we meet, they kind of have one of those big things on it. It doesn't mean I don't go in there. It doesn't mean I've ever talked to anybody, right? But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, you know, when we, when we read the Word of God and then we read church history, there's some areas where I think we've kind of missed it. And He's bringing us back. And that's what I love. So, anyway, I, you know, I just... I, I didn't want to only talk about beauty here, right? I wanted to talk a little bit about Christ. So I, I, I hope that's okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Here, here's the cool thing, though. Here's, here's where I think where the rubber really meets the road. In 1813, it, it says to be Tom. The Hebrew word Tom means like uh, blameless or complete or mature or wholehearted. So it says to be Tom there, right? And one of us in this room are really good at being Tom. <laughs> Oh, no problem, Tom. We were just talking about you know, behind your back. <laughs> no, but anyway, okay, so it lists all of these, these spiritualities and these, like, uh, things that are really real. You know, people who actually connect with the dead or whatever. Uh, people who do supernatural things through satanic powers. And, uh, and he says, and like, this stuff isn't for you, right? Drive it out of your land. And then in 13 he says, but you, you be Tom before Yahweh your God. And what I, what I get into that is, you know what, like there are all of these weird spiritualities out here. There's, there are all these things that are always assaulting the body of Christ from every side. And, and what is the answer? Maybe it isn't to be like really nitpicky or focused on the, the non-essentials or whatever. You know, maybe that isn't the greatest safeguard. Maybe the greatest safeguard is to be Tom with him. Like to be 
Um, I like the way the, the art scroll, the Orthodox Jewish translation has it. They have the word wholehearted. Be wholehearted with him. You know, I, maybe that's what he's really looking for. I, I think it is. You know, as, as we as the body of Messiah, we, we engage with him on that deep level and we let him bring us to life and, and we're Tom with him. Man, you know what? We're not going to go wrong. And, uh, we're going in the right direction. So anyway, that's, that's, I think, the conclusion of, of the matter when it comes to that. Um, a couple more, like, just practical things in this parasha that I, I really like. Uh, Deuteronomy 20, in the heading on this, it says, Laws of Warfare. It has some practical instructions about when Israel goes out to battle. And, uh, of course, that doesn't, at this point, apply to us here in Saskatchewan on a literal level. But the truth is, we are, we are not civilians, on a, spiritually speaking. Um, we are soldiers for Messiah. That's a, uh, I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, and you know, Paul used, Paul used military analogies and, uh, like weapons, weapons pictures numerous times in those letters. So I know that Paul at least was in, was in touch with that dynamic. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can see one thing in here that I've really learned in the last couple of years, um, that I think applies to us. Because we are, we are in a spiritual war, and it isn't over yet, although the major decisive battle has been won, and we're just doing the cleanup battle, right, before Yeshua, like, sweeps through and clears the place. Um, we are in a war. And, uh, verses 1 and 3, I think, speak, really speak for us. Um, it's Moses talking to the people of Israel on an emotional level. And he just says, don't be afraid. He says, when you see like an enemy that is way more massive than you and outnumbers and outpowers you and you think you're going to go down, don't be afraid because he is with you. Have any of you ever experienced that in your life or in, in, your, in your business life or in your family relationships, in your marriage? You just feel like you're going down. Like the enemy is all over you and you just have no strength to fight back. I have felt like that. And Moses' words for us are, don't be afraid. He is with you. Even if it doesn't feel like it. And then uh, and he says the same thing in verse 3. He says, uh, okay, so there's like this special military priest, right? He goes out with the, uh, with the army. And he says, Shema, Israel, listen Israel. You are approaching the battle against your enemies to me. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't be afraid or panic or tremble before them. So like he lists five different emotional terms here. Don't, don't be, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't, don't panic. Don't tremble. And, uh, you know what? When we as the body of Messiah, when we accept his call, when we set our faces like flint to accomplish the mission he's given us, we, we are going to encounter spiritual resistance. And it is going to be vicious sometimes. And everything inside of us is going to be tempted to lose heart, to get discouraged, to give up, to freak out. And uh, maybe the words of Moses apply then, hey? There's this emotional element to be aware of. Maybe that's where we get to encourage each other every day, that he is with you. He is with you. And uh, I wanted to read you, read you a, a brief quote from uh, John Eldridge's book, Waking the Dead, about that. I, I've learned a lot about, like, that spiritual element of warfare that's just a normal part of our lives. And uh, f- from John Eldridge, it's, it's really helped me wake up to that. And uh, I'll just read you like a couple couple lines. And uh, he's talking about like four main areas of discipleship. One of them that he says is often overlooked looked is the area of spiritual warfare. And he says, frankly, it may be the most critical. To live in ignorance of spiritual warfare is the most naive and dangerous thing a person can do. It's like skipping through the worst part of town, late at night, waving your wallet above your head. It's like walking into an Al-Qaeda training camp wearing an I Love the United States t-shirt. It's like swimming with great white white sharks dressed as a wounded sea lion and smeared with blood. (laughs) And let me tell you something, you don't escape spiritual warfare simply because you choose not to believe it exists or because you refuse to fight it. You know, there are people in the, 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 uh, the, the body of Christ and in the messianic movement who will say, Satan doesn't exist. I don't believe that there is a real devil. And I would liken that approach to the approach of Neville Chamberlain 
in the 1930s, denying the potency of your enemy or sticking your head in the sand and denying that he even exists will only result in your demise and the demise of your nation. We don't need Chamberlains. We need Churchills who will say we do have an enemy, he is dangerous, and we are going to be courageous and fight him. So uh, that, that, that's something that I got out of this. Uh, that's a mitzvah that I see in this parasha that maybe we could apply to us in that regard. Eh? Um, yeah. Chapter 21 is the one where if there's a, a homicide and it's un, unsolved, then the elders are to go and pray at that area. Uh, just on a very basic level, you know, some of us have actually committed to doing that in our, in our city. And that's felt really good in this last year. What a cool practical, practical example. And maybe we can just revisit that. There's a connection between the elders and spiritual maturity, uh, taking responsibility for your area and prayer. And that is something, I believe that's an invitation that we can all respond to. You know, uh, when we, when we watch the news, when we read the newspaper, when we, when we hear stuff that's going on in our city, um, as we grow in spiritual maturity, we're going to be taking responsibility for Saskatoon, for Saskatchewan, for Canada, and we're going to be praying into those things. Right? We're not going to say, oh, those dumb people who are doing that, or oh, how could they do this? We'll say, Father, we're sorry that this happened. Father, please forgive us and cleanse our land. Please, please bring revival of your Holy Spirit, your salvation. You know. So that's something that I, uh, I am definitely going in, and I, I don't feel very spiritually mature in that area, but I just really feel that invitation to to be in prayer about everyday events in our in our province, in our country. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll talk for a minute about the vision of Yeshua that we get from Deuteronomy here. The Deuteronomical vision of Messiah. Um, in this passage, we see Yeshua as the judge, Yeshua as the teacher, Yeshua as the king, Yeshua as the prophet, and Yeshua as the redeemer. Wow, that is who he is in this passage from Deuteronomy. Just three chapters. It doesn't mention him by name, but wow, the, the vision that we get of him and who he is and his job description. Um, it says that, you know, if you have a civil dispute, go to the place which Yahweh your God will choose. The Hebrew term there is the makom. And uh, in, in traditional Judaism, they say the makom, the place. That's actually talking about Messiah. That's in traditional Judaism. So where it says in Genesis, Jacob came to the place and he laid, he laid his head in that place and he used a stone in that place and he dreamed in that place and he dreamt about the ladder. And then Yeshua comes in John 1 and says, I'm the ladder. You will see the angels ascending and descending on me. Yeshua was referencing the traditional Jewish understanding of Messiah, that he is the place. So uh, what we see there is, even though we can't go to Jerusalem if we have, let's say, an argument or uh, some crisis that needs to be solved, you can go to Yeshua because he is the place. And he is always available. And uh, he's not far either, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's the judge. He's the one who teaches us the Torah. Uh, he's the teacher. He's the one who teaches us the Torah. Like it says in this passage, he's the king. Uh, oh, I love this one. In, uh, in Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, it says, Okay, when you set a king over yourself, he's, he has to be one of your countrymen. He's got to be one of your brothers. You're not allowed to set an Ish Nuhuriya, a foreign man, over yourself. What does that tell us about Yeshua if he's the ultimate king of Israel? It tells us he's not a foreign man to the Jewish people. He's a brother of the Jewish people. He is from, the, he was from their midst. And I, I believe with all my heart, with complete faith, in Hebrews 13, 18, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if when he lifted off planet Earth, he was a Jew to the core. When he comes back, our Savior is going to be a Jew to the core. He is going to be one of his brothers. So I don't know, like, if we're kind of, if we're kind of expecting, like, the blonde hair, blue eyed Malibu Jesus to come flying through the sky, I don't know, it might not happen. He might, he might, I don't know, he might look a little Jewish. I mean, we're going to be living with him for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20. He's going to be ruling from Jerusalem. I can't wait to see his face, but I don't know, maybe he'll have a huge schnoz. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe he won't be a white boy like me. So, uh, you know, all, all that to say, uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but Yeshua definitely qualifies as the king of Israel. He is a brother to the Jewish people. He is one of them. Um, also, it talks about the prophet. We already covered that. He's the prophet like Moses. And actually, there are four in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, um, Moses qualifies four things about this up-and-coming prophet. He says, 
He's g Yahweh's going to raise him. He the word that also means resurrect. So Yahweh is going to resurrect this prophet to Israel. Um, he says he's going to... Uh, I don't know, I can't find it. I'll just, yeah, I don't have it in my notes. I'll just, I'll just list them. He says he's going to raise him, and then he says he's going to, uh, he's, he's like you, so he's, he's, oh, like, in terms of like Moses, so his teachings are not going to be, uh, against the Torah. They're actually going to be, they're going to complement the Torah. They're going to be in harmony with each other. He's going to be like Moses in that regard. And there's some other levels that he'll be like Moses. Moses was rejected for a time. In his first coming, Moses was only widely received by the Jewish people, uh, the people of Israel, at his second coming, the first and second coming of Moses. Maybe that's something here about Messiah. Um, what else does it say about him? I'll put my words in his mouth. Isn't that cool? That was one of the big themes in John. Yeshua continually said, I only say what I hear from my Father. I only do it what he... You could you could almost like hear this echo, right? I... I only, I, he has put my, he has put his words in my mouth, and I only speak to them what he commands me. That's essentially what Yeshua said in the Gospel of John. And that's exactly what is prophesied about him. Um, in chapter 19, it talks about if someone is murdered accidentally, there's this re revenger of blood that comes to try and kill him from the family. This is definitely a tribal custom from the Middle East, and there were some measures taken to make sure that innocent people didn't get killed. Um, but the interesting thing is the word for like a family member who avenges the death of another family member is Goel Hadam. And Goel Hadam literally means the redeemer of blood. So you know when, when it says that Yeshua is the redeemer of Israel, there's a very dangerous and terrifying aspect to that. It means when he comes back, all the Jewish people, his brothers who have been killed over the centuries unjustly, all of the people of Israel have been persecuted Yeshua is their brother. He is their family member. Just like Paul talked about how he was. Yeshua is going to come back as the, the redeemer of blood, the avenger of his people. And I do not want to be on his bad side on that day. And you know what? That's, I don't know. I, I don't like the whole concept of violence in general and retribution isn't so pleasant either. But you know what? He's, he, that will be a day of reckoning and, uh, and it will be a good thing. Okay. Um, Couple, couple highlights from the Acts passage. These are, these are, these are like insights that will help the Jewish context of the book of Acts really come to life for us. Couple of Hebrew terms. Um, in 10 verse 2, it says that Cornelius was devout. Now, I, I like that word. That, that's a good word in English. You know, maybe it's not a word we use too often. But when you look at it in the Hebrew, it really comes to life. In Hebrew, you have some different, like, categorizations of people in terms of like where they're at with the Almighty, uh, there's, a, there's a tzaddik, a righteous person. That means he's legally right with the Almighty. It means like in general he's an observant person. He's observant of the Torah, right? Joseph was the first tzaddik on the scene in the New Testament. Uh, but then if you have someone who's intent, who's, who doesn't only do the Torah, but he goes above and beyond, and let's say he, he prays a lot, or he fasts even when he doesn't have to, that, that's what you call a, a devout person. He's not only tzaddik, he's not only righteous, he's, he's chassid. He's a chassid. That's the Hebrew word. Can we all say chassid? And as you know, there are whole, there are whole movements in Judaism, the Hasidic movement, uh, the chassidim. That's where this term comes from. It's not, it's not a new term. It's a very ancient one. Anyway, it's kind of cool that Cornelius as a Gentile was a chassid. Apparently there can be Hasidic Gentiles in the, uh, the New Testament worldview. So I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, then it says that he prayed to God. Um, I really liked how Tom's version had that. It said he prayed to God to me, like uh, regularly. Our versions will probably say constantly. Like, and we think, oh, like he was always talking to God, you know, whatever he was doing. But uh, but the Hebrew term there is tamid, and it means during the times of the morning and afternoon prayer, uh, like the uh, offerings in the temple. And sure enough, you know, this account really corroborates that he was praying in the afternoon at the time of the afternoon offering, and uh, that's when the angel appeared to him. So, oh yeah, and that's in verse three. That, that afternoon offering time in Hebrew is called Mincha. Can we all say Mincha? Yeah. So Cornelius was a chassid. Uh, he, he prayed tamid regularly, and he was praying at Mincha at the time of the afternoon offering. Um, in 10 verse 6, we, we learn that Simon Peter was staying at the house of a tanner who lived by the sea. Uh, d can I tell you something kind of funny about tanners? They were the social outcasts. They stunk. 
Do you know how they would tan hides? With dog poop, amongst other things. Yeah, really. So, like, this guy stunk really badly. That's probably why he lived by the ocean. Okay? All that to say, like, it, that Simon Peter would stay with this guy out of all the people that he could have stayed with says really says something about his humility and uh, that he took some of those lessons from his rabbi to heart. You know, about associating with the, quote, lowlifes and the outcasts and the, the misfits. Simon Peter, he really exemplified that. It's really cool. Um, this thing about the four corners. I'm just going to give you a more contextual understanding of this. Simon Peter saw this garment that was let down by its four corners. And uh, that's a buzzword in Hebrew. When you say four corners, it immediately brings two things to mind. And I'm going to tell you what they are. Firstly, okay, the Hebrew term is arba kanfot. Can we say arba kanfot? Arba is four. Achat, shtaim, shalosh, arba. All right? And kanfot is the corners. And uh, when it says that it was let down by its arba kanfot, it immediately would take any Jew who, who read his Bible, it will take his mind back, to the passage in Deuteronomy where it says, tie for yourselves tzitzit, fringes, on the arba kanfot of your garment. So I suggest to you that it wasn't just any old sheet that was being dropped down here. I, I suggest to you that Simon Peter was seeing a prayer shawl drop down with tzitzit on the corners. and all, all, Because, you know, that, that's the Hebrew phrase. That, the Torah defines that phrase. And uh, if we look at it at that, this passage is really going to come to life for us. Um, the other thing that Arba and Foden mean in, mean in the Torah is the four corners of the world, the extremities of the earth. Is Saskatchewan or BC, that, that's the Arba and Foden. That's one of the four corners of the world, eh? Like, we are on the fringe of the world in, uh, in the, like, the, 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 the uh, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew worldview, eh? So, uh, so th- this is the picture that you get. Do we, okay, and here's the other thing. It doesn't say that only unclean animals are in this sheet. It says all species of animal. So, you know, that means there are a couple of cows, like, mooing in there, and some sheep baying, and whatever else. You know, if, if this was about just food, then Simon Peter would have been like, oh, I'll grab the cow and eat the cow, right? And he would have popped the cow in his mouth or whatever. But, uh, but that's not what happened. So, so here, here's the picture that we get. Um, we get this picture of believers from Jewish backgrounds and from Gentile backgrounds who are all together in this talit in the prayer shawl. As believers, they are all, they are all clean in Messiah, and they are all clean living their lives in the parameters of what the tweet, what the four corners, what the tzitzit represent, which is a life lived according to the Bible, a life lived in the parameters of God's commandments. So, you know, to a Jew, this is what he would have understand, understood. And, uh, you know, it, it really fits the, it really fits the whole thing, too. Um, okay. Bible quizzing time. How many of us have done Bible quizzing before? Okay. I, I'm going to try to be the quiz master. We're going to do a chapter verse reference. So I need you to all get ready. Get, get on the edge of your seat. You, no, not at this point. Okay. Okay. I, I don't remember. I don't think I ever quiz mastered. It's been years since I've done quizzing, but okay. So, uh, question, uh, okay. So our first question in the quiz meet is it going to be a chapter verse reference. Chapter verse reference. Question number one, question. Uh, I better, uh, I just, I have to get my card. Sorry, I draw my card that has the question on it here. Okay, chapter verse reference. According to Acts chapter 10, verse 36, preaching what? Colin, you can come up to the front. <laughs> to the mic. Oh, yeah, there, here's the mic. This there. is taking me back years. <laughs> no. um, the message of this life. I'm sorry, Colin. You can sit down. <laughs> okay, let's try again. But you have to wait until I ask the question again, and then you can jump up and come up to the front. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, okay, so anyway, question number two in the quiz. Uh, chapter verse, oh my, it's the same question. Well, that's kind of interesting. Okay, so chapter verse reference. Question number two, question. According to Acts chapter 10, verse 36, preaching what? You know the answer, jump up. Uh, Mark, you, peaching priests through Jesus Christ. Peace. That is correct. Good job, Mark. 20 points to Mark's team. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just, this is cool. What's the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. I, I just think that's special. 
Like, the whole element of shalom, it's not just like a buzzword. It's not just a nice, happy word that we, that we say hello with and goodbye with and whatever. It's like shalom is actually the core of the gospel. Like, shalom sums up the gospel through Yeshua the Messiah. There's something about shalom that epitomizes the message that we've been given to bring to the world. So I don't know about you, but again, for me, that really brings this whole concept of shalom to life. In fact, I, I think the first time I ever saw the word shalom was at Odell's house. I think you had like a wooden plaque just inside in, in your front door and it said shalom. Yeah? That's so funny. Did it say shalom, y'all? I just think that's cool that if, you know, in this case, if Simon Peter could pick one word to sum up the message of the gospel, it would be shalom. I, I just wanted to read you a short quote to finish um, from David Stern's uh, Messia, uh, Jewish New Testament commentary. It's, it, it has some helpful, um, gives some helpful background to Simon Peter and his reluctance to even go to the house of a Gentile, much less eat with them or whatever. Um, he says, he says, at one point the Mishnah says straightforwardly, the dwellings of Gentiles, or literally Canaanites, meaning Gentiles in the land of Israel, are ritually unclean. Oh, hello, 18.7. So they viewed these as ritually unclean. Uh, most of Mishnah tractate of Vodazara, idol worship, is devoted to limiting the contact Jews may have with Gentiles, literally idol worshippers. For example, according to chapter 2, Jews may not remain alone with Gentiles, leave cattle at their inns, assist them in childbirth, suckle their children, do business with them when they're traveling to idolatrous festivals, drink their milk or vinegar or wine, which is why there is such a thing as kosher wine. Maybe that explains that. I know I've always wondered why is there kosher wine. The Tanakh says nothing about it, of course. Or eat their bread or oil or pickled vegetables. Or, in the Gemara on this section, their cooked food. So anyway, that of course is an example of Judy adding to the Torah things that it doesn't explicitly say. And uh, it took a twice-repeated vision, full-on vision, to break Simon Peter out of this, this uh, mental mold that he had. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you in your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would in turn support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page, where you can make a one-time donation, or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who has taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.